Uh, yes, so we will have an introduction uh, to this project and uh, then a little more information of, uh, with the examples that has turned out from Iceland, what that says is the basis for the project. Then a little about ISO for those that are new to ISO and the uh, workshop agreement process. Then a um, promising practice um, uh, from the Council of Europe about this project and the closure. So I leave to uh, our proposed chair person of this project, which is Paul. Are you there? I will stop sharing now. I'm here. Now the most exciting part is this will all work. You can hear me? Yes. Okay. And hopefully you have the right view on this now. Yes, thanks. Okay. So we're good to go. Thank you, Joachim, and, and welcome to you all. And thank you for joining our webinar today on guidelines for Barnahus, a child-friendly multidisciplinary and interagency response model for abused children. First, in my short introduction, I'd like to start with the question, why are we doing this? One in eight or 12.5% of children in the world have been sexually abused and or sexually exploited at some time in their lives, according to studies. A new survey data among children in Iceland shows that 17% of girls and 5% of boys have suffered from some form of sexual abuse by the age of 16. Globally, it is estimated that based on data from 24 mostly high- and middle-income countries that 8 to 31% of girls and 3 to 17% of boys under the age of 18 have been the victims of sexual abuse. The impact of violence is devastating, immediate, and lifelong. Violence against children impairs their brain development, their physical and mental health, and their ability to learn. The economic costs are also staggering. This is from the annual report of the special representative of the Secretary General of the United Nations on Violence Against Children to the Human Rights Council last year. This is, of course, well documented in UN publications by UNICEF, the World Health Organization, and others, with reference to studies and resources. The impact of violence on children, mental health problems, anxiety and depression, hallucinations, memory disturbances, and suicide attempts. A child who is sexually abused or exploited is also at greater risk of experiencing other types of violence or abuse from adults or peers in a range of settings. Of course, these findings come of no surprise, but it is important to bear in mind in our work. Because prevention is a priority, but the response is also critical. And from these facts, Barnahus is originated to give children that are vict victims of sexual abuse the best protection, treatment, care, and justice. In 1998, the Barnahus Children's House was established in Iceland. Now there are over 40 Barnahouses in over 20 European countries. We will later in the webinar learn more about the functions of Barnahus, but in very short, the main function of the model is the coordination of the parallel criminal and child welfare investigation, where the physical health and mental health care is provided without any hesitation in parallel with the forensic criminal investigation and the provision of child protection. Since Barnahus was established, it has been recognized as a promising practice by some of the leading institutions of children's rights. The Council of Europe has promoted the Barnhus model since 2015. 
UNICEF has supported, funded, and helped states in implementing Barnahus in several states. Barnahus has also been recognized by the Special Representative of the Secretary General of the United Nations on Violence Against Children in her reports. The UN Committee on the Rights of the Child has made several references to the Barnahus model and recommended to state parties to set up child-friendly and multi-agency structures. The European Union has funded and supported member states in setting up Barnahus projects. But even if it is a known model, the practices differ and better tools are needed for implementation of Barnahus. Therefore, the Ministry of Education and Children in Iceland proposed to ISO, the International Organization for Standardization, to build international guidelines in cooperation with the Icelandic Standards and the Swedish Institute for Standards. This proposal has been approved by ISO. The process of building an international workshop agreement will be explained in more details by the Secretariat, the Swedish Institute for Standards. The aim of the IVA is to develop an agreement on requirements and refining the best practices of Barnahus. The purpose is to align requirements and harmonize the operation and in different systems around the world. They will be in line with recommendations of the UN Committee of the Rights of the Child and the Council of Europe. The process in developing an IVA is flexible decided by the proposer and gives stakeholders more possibilities in participate, to participate than in developing a regular standard. If everything goes by plan, ISO will publish the guidelines in February next year. In this work, we will bring together experts in every field, experts of law enforcement, prosecution, mental and physical health, child protection, and of course, standardization, and develop an agreement on requirements. We will be looking for best practices. So it is important for us to have input from these various stakeholders mentioned, the law enforcement, prosecution, mental and physical health, child protection, and standardization. As a recent mapping of, Barnahus, of, the, Bar, of the Barnahus journey in Europe has shown, they differ, and we believe better guidelines will help in the implementation. We will be using proven methods developed by ISO, the best known standardization body in the world with more than 170 member states to build the guidelines. We are bringing the child-friendly Barnahus model to the international level, not only focusing on Europe, and create more awareness on the issue. Bearing in mind the long-term goal, that is to build standards of child rights and to have children rights integrated into management systems of public and private organizations. This will be done in compliance with the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the Lanzarote Convention and recommendations of international bodies. I hope you will join us on this journey and with your expertise contribute to the output. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Pade. And then I think we go straight over to to next point. If Olaf, if you have your presentation, yes. Okay, can you see it now or? No. Okay. Um, mm -mm. Can you see my slides now? Uh, well, not in presentation mode. Ah, okay. Yeah. Sorry, I chose the wrong uh, one. While Olaf is, I can also see, as you can see, that uh, uh, there are uh, lots of useful uh, links in the chat um, of the what part of what we have heard. 
I'll speak about and also from the Council of Europe. Yeah. Okay, can you see it now? Uh, no, it's still not in presentation. Okay, uh, that's strange. Um, okay. Yes, this okay. is good. <laughs> okay, sorry for that. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Joachim. Um, yes, my name is Ola Vasta, and I'm General Director of the National Agency for Children and Families. And um, I also worked in Partnerhus in Iceland for over 20 years. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Icelandic Partnerhus and also about um, uh, the mission and challenges and what Partnerhus is all about. Um, so, Uh, the basic functions uh, of Barnahus is child abuse cases where we have children from three and a half up to 18 years old. Of course, sometimes in Iceland we see children who are younger than three and a half. But three and a half is something that we think is the, the age limit for children to disclose about abuse and go uh, and be interviewed in a forensic interview. In Bartnerhus is also three types of forensic interviews. Uh, we have investigative interviews for the court and uh, the or criminal investigation. We have exploratory interview for the Child Protection Service. And we also added since 2016, uh, interview for unaccompanied children. Um, in partner who's also is a medical examination where we can where we get the doctors from the university hospital coming to partners and seeing children there and meeting them in a child friendly setting where we have a pediatrician gynecologue and a nurse who are specialized in children. Um, then we have victim assessment and therapy. And we have both short-term therapy and long-term therapy in partners, depending on what the children need. Family counseling and support, which is very important to support the family and the parents uh, because they are the caregivers for the children, of course, non-offending parents. Uh, we have instructions to other professionals, both to teach them, helping them to discover sexual abuse and physical abuse cases, people who are working with children, uh, like teachers, and then we also have a huge database about children's abuse or child abuse in Iceland since uh, back to 2005. A mission of Barnahus is to facilitate a collaboration and coordination of the Child Protection Service, the police, the prosecution, and the medical profession in the investigation of child abuse cases sexual abuse cases, physical abuse cases, and domestic violence. Uh, the mission is also to provide a child-friendly setting for joint investigative interviews and medical examination. And in those interviews, while the child is disclosing for first time, all the people are, who are watching are in another room uh, watching the interview through the TV screen. It's the prosecutor, it's the judge, it's the police, child protection service, the defense lawyer, the child's legal advocate, and possibly the offender himself or herself. Um, the mission is also to ensure professional implementation of investigative interviewers, where we have in Iceland, for example, uh, uh, psychologists who are interviewing uh, children uh, who are specialized in children development, and also they are specially trained in those investigative interviews uh, type protocol we are using, which are evidence-based. A mission of partners is also to ensure professional implementation of investigative interviews, sorry, um, and to ensure that all children receive the same service, regardless of where they live in the country. So the Icelandic partner serves the whole country. Uh, the mission is also to 
to make sure that the child victim and their family receives appropriate assessment, treatment and support, which is very important for the child uh, well-being in the future and also uh, while the treatment is uh, going on. The mission is also to establish professional work practice and guidelines by interdisciplinary cooperation, because it, this cooperation is very important since uh, learning and understanding how other people work, uh, like the police, if the police, uh, what the police need in investigating cases like criminal cases, uh, what the prosecutor service needs in, in uh, uh, in those cases, and also to understand uh, the need of the Child Protection Service. Uh, the mission is also to enhance specialized knowledge on child abuse cases and to mediate that knowledge as, as appropriate to the other professionals, people working in, in, in Child Protection Service, working like teachers and children also, and the public alike. And the main mission is also to uh, not to harm the child and preventing that the child is re-victimized or re-traumatized uh, in that, uh, in that um, process. If we look at the four rooms of Bardnahus, Paul mentioned that a little bit, and the four rooms of Bardnahus are where the child gets service under one roof. The child doesn't need to go to different agency, meet different people, but the people are coming and meet the child in Bardnahus. And we can say it's like a one-stop shop for the child, where we have and keep the child in the middle, in the center, and we meet the child in a child-friendly way. We often talk about the four rooms um, where we have the child protection room, where the child, we think about the child welfare and prevent the child to be a victim again and uh, to provide that the child, uh, uh, pre protect that the child is not uh, uh, abused again, so to speak. And there the in part knows the child meets the child protection service uh, professional. This is also for the criminal investigation. We can talk about the criminal investigation room where we have the forensic interviewing and the child is interviewed and give the disclosure, which are taped in, uh, in, uh, and recorded, bo both uh, audio and video recorded. And that recording is what is used in the courtroom later on. Uh, that is the what we aim for is the one interview the child goes through where the child is telling the story. And that's why it's so important that the child uh, has... Um, uh, sorry. Can you mute? No. So where the child is uh, uh, interviewed in a child-friendly setting. We also have in Bardnahus, we have this medical examination, like I mentioned, where the uh, doctors coming from the university hospital meeting the child in a child-friendly uh, setting, because it's very important that we think about that the child is not sick and minimize the anxiety if, because many children are afraid of going to a hospital. They are afraid of the smell they feel. So doing that in a child-friendly way where we have partners is very important. Where you think about how we meet the child and it's, they are not sick and so on. And also what is very important that since it's not the hospital, we give the child a very good time while they come for this medical examination. Um, Multidisciplinary interagency service means that we share with the other professionals the information. So usually when the child has disclosed about the sexual abuse case, for example, uh, the medical examination, uh, they, the doctors will know about what really happened. They don't need to ask the child. The therapist doesn't need to ask the child. They know what happened. So we share the information to 
try to minimize the anxiety, minimize the traumatization the child needs to go through if they have to disclose over and over again. So also we have a one room left, which is the child well-being room where we have assessment and therapy. And that is very important that partners cover all those four rooms. When we have different agency meeting the child in a child-friendly setting, it's more likely that the child is feeling more safe and it's more likely that the child disclose more since we can lower the anxiety of the child. Um, also, what I want to mention is before the interview, the forensic interview, which is the first step the child usually take into partnerhoods, is the meeting with different agency before the main interview, where different uh, people come together and discuss uh, what uh, is in that case. In that meeting, we have the forensic interviewer, we have the prosecutor, we have the police and the child, uh, uh, child pro pro no, not the child protect, the child protection service, sorry. In that meeting, everyone can put something on the table and talk about what's important for the police to know, for the prosecutor to know, what everyone know about the case, for the forensic interviewer to do the best possible interview. Child-friendly setting is very important because when we have a child-friendly environment, we have a friendly location for children. It's more likely that we can minimize the child anxiety about disclosing about and working and go through treatment in child sexual abuse cases and also in physical abuse cases. If we think about this might be the most difficult thing the child goes through. But if we can use the environment, we can use the child friendly, how we meet the child in a child friendly way, we can minimize anxiety. And that is very helpful for the prosecutor, for the police and for the judge who need to make decision in that criminal case if the child can disclose as much as possible, because what we know is when children are very anxious, it is less likely that they remember everything. It, this is a very stressful situation, but if we can minimize that stressful situation, it's more likely that the brain, and if we look at how the brain works, um, it's more likely that the children can recognize, they can remember things that happen to them. And that's also why very important that we don't ask them many questions or many times, and we uh, try to focus on one interview because children might uh, get tired of disclosing over and over about what happened to them. So that's why it's so important that we share the information within a partner's. Also, children get proper assessment and therapy. We have interviewing rooms which are age appropriate. We also use interview technique, which is age appropriate. And also we meet the, uh, for the children and the victims and the family in a way where they feel as relaxed as possible. What is very important if we think about uh, this model is that children knows what happens next. They get information after they disclose what will happen and how they will be protected from further abuse. Um, as I told you before, we aim for one investigative interview and the child will get a proper assessment, support, and therapy because the case is already in partners. We also get, we will do some case planning. Uh, we will meet the child in their hometown since partners in Iceland uh, serves the whole country. Uh, we have uh, specialized staff who are specially trained in, in both in forensic interviewing and in, in uh, therapy, in for children. 
We have evidence-based uh, practice and protocol, both in therapy and uh, the forensic interviewing protocols. And the importance of database and data collection in the, this uh, partner host is very important to learn and to know uh, about abuse cases in the country and gather the information in one place. And that's also very important in prevention and future planning, how we can do better in, in, the, in our field, in our work. Training of professionals and guidance and supervision and counseling is also very important. If we think about uh, having people working there for a long time, uh, that's very important. The specialist working in partners, they need uh, to be well-trained. They also need the supervision uh, because so we can uh, work there for a longer time because that experience and that knowledge is very important in the future. Um, if we look at the experience after over 20 years in Iceland, we see that we have efficient efficient and professional and child-friendly work procedures and case management in partners. Uh, Re-victimization of child victim is minimized by having partners. Appropriate therapeutic service is secured. A mutual professional trust among different agencies is also what we have gained. Uh, and that takes time to have this mutual professional trust. It takes time to get everyone on board. And now it is runs very smoothly in Iceland. Uh, increased public awareness and confidence in the authorities is also what we have gained through those years and increased rate of discovery. Uh, and, but we are always dealing with some new challenges. It's something that we have learned. And I want the last slide, I want to show you a little bit about uh, the, the changes in this field in partners from the beginning. This is a amount of a uh, number of forensic interviews in partners from the beginning in 1998. And you can see that it's increasing all the time. And new challenging challenges I was mentioning are like if we look at the COVID period, uh, 2020 and up to 22, where we had a number of increasing in uh, abuse cases. And that's because the sexual abuse uh, cases, they changed. Physical abuse uh, increased, but what happened is that a increase in cyber crimes uh, were numbers. So that's what we see that but also what we have learned, we have uh, done some research this last autumn where we see that children are disclosing in more about abuse and they also know their rights. They know about bad news. They know that someone will grab them if they disclose. So in the beginning, we saw that top of the children in the like top of the iceberg would disclose about abuse, uh, which is less than 10%. But in a newly research, we saw that children in 10th grade who had been abused or touched by someone grown up, in 33% of those cases, they had already disclosed to someone grown up. Of course, we want to see that number get higher, but that's something we have gained also. In the end, I want to say that it's important to have a well-functioning multidisciplinary interagency model, which is child-friendly, to help in investigating a criminal case and also to have children in the future prosperity life who become a good and valid members of the society in the future. So that's why it's so important that we catch children as soon as possible and we can provide a good and well-functioning therapy and meet them in a child-friendly way to have these children in the future as a prosperity uh, individuals in the future. So thank you very much.
<clears throat> Thank you, Olo. Uh, then uh, uh, I, I see there are people sharing their experience and links in, in the chat, but uh, I go along here with uh, the next um, part, which is uh, explanation of uh, ISO and the uh, uh, International Workshop Agreement process. So, uh, just a, sh a short word about, about ISO for those that are new. Uh, I, this international uh, organization for, for, for standardization, it's an independent non-governmental organization. It consists of a global network of national standards bodies, which one member per country. For example, um, uh, I'm with the Swedish Institute for Standard, which is the Swedish national standards body. Uh, uh, so ISO provides a platform for developing practical tools through common understanding and cooperation with all stakeholders, uh, normally by creating standards, international standards. However, um, there are uh, other means of getting together under the uh, ISO umbrella, which is, this is an international workshop agreement. So it's a document produced uh, or an agreement produced through a workshop meeting rather than through the full ISO technical committee process. Uh, market players and other stakeholders directly participate in developing uh, a workshop agreement and do not have to go through a national delegation. That's the main difference, I would say. Normally, we create a technical committee and all the member countries have their own committees uh, mirroring this and uh, vote as a country and so on but this is the international workshop agreement uh, is more a participant in the individual capacity directly from the stakeholders uh, so um, uh, and that is what, what, what we are aiming at and um, uh, there are of course it will not uh, lead to a document as a as 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 a standard with what, what what that means because that's a longer process also it usually takes several years and uh, in order to be get approved by several countries uh, but uh, this is an agreement of the individuals participating in the workshop uh, so uh, when is this used? Uh, Pali mentioned a few, few of the arguments it gives visibility to professional practices or can be, we can have reference documents, uh, help shape the future direction and can influence any future ISO standards. So it can serve as a base for, for possible future uh, international standardization work. Allow you to develop relationship within a profession or sector, create understanding and coordination amongst various stakeholders. For example, if you do it a little uh, different in different countries or settings, here you can share best practice in in this sector and improve therefore improve the quality and interoperability and how to how to speak about it so it could be uh, researched and so on a little e easier over the borders so it leads to worldwide visibility uh, due to the ISO member distribution networks uh, as well uh, Yes, so the time frame we are talking about here, Pala mentioned it. It you have until the end of August to register to the workshop. Uh, the the main workshop is in October, which is a physical workshop in Reykjavik. Uh, uh, before this, uh, we will have an introductory meeting, digital meeting on September five, uh, and the main uh, things there is to agree on the title and scope and the basic outline of the document, not going into details, but uh, one example could be, should we call it uh, anything related to Barnahus, this specific term, or should we use the more, a more general uh, model description, uh, for example, that could be one of the discussion topics for the September meeting. And then in October, we're going more into the details, what, what should the actual content be? Uh, then we pre preliminary plan that uh, December for uh, follow up and agree, but we may 
result in additional uh, meetings or so, or or if it's needed, we don't know that exactly. So that will be up to the workshop participant to agree on. And uh, the outcome of an international workshop agreement doesn't process does not necessarily be a published document. We aim at that for this case, but we have already heard that when we're starting now to circulate this, that, that this it could be a future pr a proper standardization work to maybe create a technical committee and so on in the future. So it could also serve as a basis for, for a possible future standardization project. Uh, Yes, there's some questions that has arise, so I just want to clarify. Uh, can you attend only some of the planned events or attend virtually at the workshop in October? Um, and uh, the answer is no. Uh, I mean, uh, we and the, uh, I mean, usually in, in the transparency of, of ISO, we have different modes of participate, but in this case, we have. Um, uh, uh, agreed that it will be most from a practical point of view uh, actually to be able to agree we see only today we are over 70 participants with relatively short notice so we know that's a big interest in the, all over around the world to participate but in order to actually get an agreement and have a sort of document we want to uh, uh, make it more discussion uh, friendly, uh, and also the the events in September is it's connected to the workshop in October because so it's more a, it's a preparatory meeting. Uh, that that is uh, why. Uh, of course, if if that something happens or so, uh, we we but but the principle is that if you registered, you will be on all those events. Uh, so, and the other question, are there any fees for participation and or is there any external funding for participation? Um, and the answer is there are no fees to take part in the workshop. So it sometimes is uh, when an international workshop agreement is financed by the stakeholders and also or in ordinary standardization when you participate it's normally some sort of fee uh, by joining the national committee in order to take part but this is this part is funded uh, i mean the secretariat uh, uh, and the uh, uh, iceland uh, hosting uh, the the venue conference venue so this this is financed by the by the uh, icelandic government uh, uh, but uh, so there are no external funding but so each participant organization take their own costs when participating travel accommodation etc so um we clarify that. And um, as I said before, uh, you, you participate in an individual capacity, uh, but although national positions or national mirror groups are not required for an international workshop agreement, it could sometimes be valuable in order to provide input and feedback to the individuals that participate. So uh, that sort of forum may be organized through a national standardization body or any other organization, children's rights organization, governmental institution. Uh, for example, to allocate resources, we can, we, we can afford to send one or two experts, for example, in this place. So, and this is just uh, tips. If you are looking into that, uh, if such meeting is to be organized mid-September or mid -October, to mid-October, that period would be a relevant time because then we have a sort of a draft to actually go through and give comments on if your so, so uh, um, participant can bring these views to the workshop in October 23-24. Uh, so, um, uh, yes, and... Um, well, uh, as you maybe have seen, we have a dedicated website uh, for this project, and the full proposal is actually available. You can scroll down on this page. You, you have the full, it's an invitation letter which has been circulated to ISO members, but this is also available on the site. So you can see the full proposal as it is now, uh, a sort of a draft we can use as a discussion document.
can you register here? Uh, uh, we will delete the webinar registration. And if you, for some reason, have, have registered, but with this information you uh, make, you cannot attend, there's actually no way of automatically un unregistered, but you, I will send an email to all that have registered. I will do one sort of email back in July and one when we're closing in August. So just answer me if if you have registered wrongly, then I will put you away from the list. And so I will circulate uh, venue details and so on in July and August. But is there any other questions you can email me there? Uh, I think that was it for, for my side. Uh, then I think we just carry on with Regina. Good morning, everyone, or afternoon, depending on where you are on the globe. Uh, I'm going to share my PowerPoint presentation. Um, let me see. Can you tell me if this is working? Is it okay? Uh, it's not That's the presentation mode. Stop sharing. And now it's still uh, yes, it's better. And you are a little low, so try to speak up or a little closer to a microphone, but th then we will be okay. Okay. All right. Okay. So you can see now the, the PowerPoint. Yes, we can. Full screen. Okay, and it's moving along. All right, great. So good morning, everyone. It's really a pleasure, a very exciting uh, opportunity for the Council of Europe to be part of uh, this uh, ISO IWA process. Um, um, I wanted to, because uh, there are uh, a very high number of uh, participants, including outside the Council of Europe, I just wanted to do a short recap uh, what the Council of Europe is. So it's an intergovernmental organization of uh, 46 member states, including all of the EU member states. So the Council of Europe should not be confused with the e European Union, even if, and especially in the context of Barnahus, we collaborate very closely. So our values are about human rights, democracy, and the rule of law, and we're the home uh, to the European Court of Human Rights. And uh, we develop a number of legal standards which help uh, our states progress and uh, move on in upholding the human rights, democracy, and the rule of law, including for children. And we adopt recommendations that guide uh, states in developing their policy. So we also have mechanisms uh, to monitor the these legal standards through um, committee work so uh, state or independent or depending on the the, the kind of committee uh, they meet uh, several times a year to go through the conventions to see how uh, the state is putting it into practice and then we have a third way of working which is to cooperate and to support states to make progress and to put into practice uh, the recommendations from the monitoring bodies or to support them in changing their legislation. Uh, these are what we call bilateral cooperation projects. And sometimes we have multilateral cooperation projects which help us to work together with a group of states to, to, um, to, uh, to strengthen legisl legislation. So what is the Council of Europe? Uh, why are we interested in, in this? Um, and uh, where are we actually coming from? So uh, when we think about Barnahus, uh, we uh, are working, our key priority is to, uh, uh, one of our key priorities in the area of children's rights is to protect children from child sexual exploitation and abuse. And all of this work is first and foremost framed in the Lanzarote Convention, which is a uh, which key aim is to protect, to prevent, and to prosecute, and to ensure that children are participating in judicial proceedings uh, where they have been victims of child sexual exploitation and abuse. 
So this is a convention which has also a monitoring body. So there are experts who uh, come to Strasbourg uh, or online uh, that are parties to the conventions that have signed and ratified. And um, Barna Hus, or multidisciplinary and interagency responses, um, are uh, really anchored in the convention, in the various articles, which call on states to coordinate, to investigate, to interview the child, and to protect, uh, put in place protection measures and assistance to victims. So we have today 48 state parties. Um, and this is actually, it was our starting, starting point. And it is a convention, which is what we call an open convention. So it's a convention which states from other parts uh, of the world can actually request to uh, accede to or to ratify. So they become part of a, uh, the Lanzarote family, the Lanzarote world, where we are making progress step by step. So, um, we also work in the context of the Council of Europe guidelines on child-friendly justice, which are part of the environment of the Lanzarote Convention. And all of this work um, is uh, aligned with the UN Sustainable uh, Development Goals, with the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, with the work of the UNCRC. We work with UNICEF, we work with CBSS. So we work really in a world where we're bringing everyone together in order to make progress. So our Barnahu story in the Council of Europe started off uh, in the Lanzarote Committee, which identified Barnahu's and the Barnahu's model as a promising uh, practice. And this was, of course, uh, proposed by the Icelandic uh, member of the committee who, uh, representing Iceland, uh, explained how children that have been victims of sexual violence are being supported through the, the Barnahus model that has been very well explained by Olaf uh, Asta just a little bit earlier. So I'm not going to go into that. But since the introduction of uh, Barnahus in Iceland, which was also inspired by the uh, child advocacy centers in the US, because I wanted to recognize that as well. So even if uh, the Barnahus in Iceland was the first uh, structure in Europe, there are also the advocacy centers in the US, and I, I hope that there are also representatives from them in this, uh, this meeting, because they also have developed all kinds of different interesting process, procedures and protocols. But we realized that there, um, that twice as many cases of suspected child sexual abuse have been investigated when the child is brought to the, the, the Barnahus, and uh, three times as many cases have been prosecuted and the number of convictions doubled because one of the, and I think this is really the magic of it because we are also expected to uphold justice um, for children. And I think that this is something that we have to bear in, bear in mind. So in my world, uh, this was really crucial. We are protecting, we are ensuring that children are listened to and taken seriously and uh, that crimes are acted upon. Uh, we are strengthening the prosecution, the investigation. Um, and um, I think that what was really explained well by all of us that, that everyone is, is working around it, law enforcement. I'm very happy to see that Tony from Europol is also here and who has shared very interesting work of the big role that important role that law enforcement also has. So it's really an environment where we see uh, that we are making progress. So it does not necessarily require an important financial investment, but putting in place a Barnahus, it's really about working methods, it's about changing mindsets. It's about changing mindset that children are right holders, they have a right to access uh, justice and they have a right to be supported and, and to be uh, uh, accompanied uh, in in uh, this uh, difficult journey. So obviously there has been uh, it's 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 evolved quite a lot since uh, the Council of Europe started working and promoting Barnahus. We know that it is not uh, uh, it's been replicated in the Nordic countries, of course, but not only. And I see that uh, there are researchers that have been uh, posting in the chat uh, books uh, or, or publications that I have not seen yet. I'm very happy. So thank you. Um, uh, I think that there's so much happening in this uh, space, if I can call it that, that I think it's important that we 
um, we understand the same thing. The ex we have the same kind of expectations, which is why I think that the IWA um, guidelines will be extremely helpful for us to under, not just to speak that we have a barn hose, but we want to be sure that it is not, uh, uh, we want to be sure that it is being uh, run in the right way, that all of the right uh, professionals are around the table, that they are uh, are trained, uh, that legislation uh, is in line with what is expected. But we also know that the, this is not a one size fits all solution. And for each state, there is a need to, to adapt uh, in the context of the specific legal policy or institutional framework in that country. And this is something that we have really experienced through the various projects that we are running in the Council of Europe member states. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. But we actually promote uh, a step-by-step -step approach uh, when states are integrating or embracing the, the model and impl implementing Barnaud's model. We also know that it is a model that evolves um, we also note uh, through this really uh, close cooperation we have with our states um, that there are new kinds of protocols that are being developed, uh, the trainings are evolving, the cases that of children that come to the uh, or are brought to the Barnahus um, are changing as well because we live uh, in a world where uh, uh, things move very quickly. Uh, we are seeing more uh, cases uh, related to the digital environment, the online child sexual abuse. So we need to always to be able to adapt to the, the cases that are brought. We also see that there are states that are looking at how can Barnahus and the interviewing protocols used in Barnahus support uh, uh, parents that are separating and that are having a difficult time and the child uh, somehow gets caught up in all of this. Is, so we, we see really that there's also an evolution. So we have to be careful not to call everything a Barnahus model. And I think this is where uh, the ISO is going to come in and to bring other um, technical guidelines uh, along to support us in making sure that the right quality is there. So we need uh, technical standards to, to really to be sure that the, 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 the quality is there. We already have technical standards, of course. We have worked together with the uh, with uh, with uh, with the, the CPSS, we have worked together with the Promise Project. We've worked together, but each state needs to have its own uh, its own uh, own standards. So, uh, just to give you a snapshot uh, of what we've been doing, so we have worked in Ukraine in 2017, uh, where we did what we call a feasibility assessment, and then in 21 we did an analysis of the legal framework of Barnahus, which is. Uh, uh, in Ukraine, and now it is uh, our colleagues in UNICEF who have a, a, a big presence in, in, in Ukraine who are uh, supporting the Ukrainian authorities in, in running those, uh, those uh, or in, in developing those uh, Barnhouse models. In Slovenia, we supported them to for the process to adapt the model and to establish and to operate Barnahus uh, through the uh, the EU structural reform support services. So we really uh, accompanied also with the Norway grant. So we we've been able to pull together different uh, um, institutions that uh, believe that Barnahus is something that every state should have, and we somehow uh, with everyone's goodwill and motivation we are able to to. Uh, to support states in making that happen. So in Finland, we had a project as well to support for further uh, the coordination between the different Barnahus units in Ireland. And I think I see some of my colleagues from Ireland in the, in the meeting. There are projects to support them uh, to further develop the, the Barnahus in Galway. In Spain, it is uh, there's a project which is working on harmonizing the, and standardizing the practices through the different regions because Spain has a, uh, I believe, together with Save the Children, been um, uh, putting in place uh, Barnahus uh, in order to, uh, in the different regions. And then the Council of Europe came in to support uh, at at, uh, at state level um, the, the coordination between the different, uh, be between the different regions. Um, and we've just started a project in Croatia and there are more to come. So I think that uh, it's important that everyone is aligned, that everyone um, does what they can uh, in order for us to make this happen. But I think that it's going to be extremely uh, important for us to be able to uh, to have guidance, which 
um, can also be uh, shared with states that are outside um, of the Council of Europe uh, region, which is for me why it's very interesting um, to be part of this group. And I really look forward to uh, to uh, going down this path and this journey until the end of the year. For me, it seems to be very quick. It's only a few months um, as a project. Uh, I, uh, uh, but I, I trust and I believe in the ISO uh, secretariat and the Swedish colleagues to be able to run this together with the Icelandic uh, colleagues. I have a few other slides which I'm not going to um, go through. I think they are pretty much uh, similar to what uh, uh, Olaf has already said. Um, and uh, if anyone is interested, you are more than welcome to reach out to me. Uh, I also pulled up a few um, examples of tools that we have developed through our projects, which is interesting. Um, so we developed research frameworks for conducting a feasibility assessment, uh, national guidelines for Barnahus. Uh, we help uh, states develop uh, roadmaps on how to make it happen. Uh, in Slovenia, they, they adopted a specific law on Barnahus, which is the, the first time that we have seen a state adopt a, a dedicated law to the setting up of, uh, of Barnahus. We also help states to prepare a communication strategy, which I think is really important as well, because people need to be informed um, about what Barnahus is. And, and there are often uh, uh, the general public, they don't understand uh, why there is a need for a Barnahus. They do not necessarily always want to understand how big of a problem child sexual exploitation and abuse really is. Um, parents need to be reassured. So I think it's really important to have communication plans and strategies. So we've also helped the states put uh, budget templates, uh, overall project methodologies, training of trainers for forensic interviewing. So this is really a wealth of, um, of all kinds of different tools that uh, we have developed. And um, we are of course more than happy to, to uh, share all of this uh, with, uh, with you. Um, and I think that now I will uh, thank you. I wish uh, all of you, uh, uh, all of us uh, really uh, good luck. Uh, this is uh, uh, it's going to be an intense journey, but I think uh, it's going to be really excellent. I would ask also my colleague uh, Magdalena if uh, she could maybe share, I don't know, the states outside of the, the Council of Europe membership, if they are in the meeting, but I think there's a leaflet on why join the Lanzarote Convention, which might be interesting for states that are not in the, in the Council of Europe. Uh, uh, if they they uh, if that would be also uh, of help and and support to the states that wish also to embark on a Barnhus uh, journey, thank you, Joachim, and I'm of course available for any questions. Uh, thanks, thank you, Regina, uh, and um, yes, over to Helga. Yeah. So are my slides up yet? It's um, not presentation mode slides, but... Uh... What about now? Yes, now. Yes. Okay. So um, I'm Helga. I will be your host in Iceland. And we aim for... Uh, what? How, how can I say it? We aim for a warm welcome in a cold climate. Um, the workshop itself uh, will take place in the uh, Hilton uh, Nordica, Hilton Reykjavik Nordica Hotel, which is located uh, 12 minutes uh, away from the city center. Um, and my, my aim is to just support the chair and the secretary of this workshop uh, project. So, so we will be in Reykjavik. Uh, Hilton Reykjavik Nordica offers spacious rooms. Uh, they offer a spa with both the sauna and whirlpool, fitness center, lounges, a bar, a really good restaurant, and of course, very good meeting and conference facilities. Um, we have arranged um, a discount rate for the hotel rooms if they're booked before August 12th. So single rooms are uh, at around 222 US dollars and double rooms around 250. Um, as Joachim mentioned earlier, the workshop itself is sponsored by the Icelandic Ministry of Education and Children. 
and we will offer you a lunch at the Vox restaurant uh, both days, which is in the hotel as well. Uh, traveling to and from the airport, um, we do not have um, any agreements on fixed uh, taxi rates uh, as they do in many countries. So um, we recommend that you always negotiate beforehand. There is this one company that offers fixed uh, price, which is quite high, around 143 US dollars uh, door to door from the airport to, to the hotel. You can always catch, also catch the flight bus from the terminal. We don't have any trains in Iceland yet, uh, but you can catch the flight bus from the terminal to the hotel with a few stops on the way. And tickets can be purchased uh, either uh, on board Iceland air flights, online or in the arrival hall in the uh, terminal. You should expect cold weather. The average temperature in Iceland in October is been between three and seven and a half degrees Celsius. We have an average of 93 hours of sunshine in October, and you can expect all seasons in one day, wind, rain, snow, sun, and everything in between. So bring your coats, your boots, your hats, your mittens, your warm sweaters, and you will be okay. But the houses are very warm though. So Reykjavik is the northernmost city in the world. It has 250,000 inhabitants. 60% per percent are of originally for, are originally foreign citizens and they're of 10% from Poland. Iceland is one of the smallest linguistic areas in the world. It has one of the smallest currencies in the world, the Icelandic krona. Uh, you might have heard some volcanic activities uh, in the recent years, most of them within safety measures, unless for the citizens of uh, the small fishing village Grindavik, who evacuated their town in November 2023, and uh, the government is buying up all their houses because we have no idea what is going to uh, go on in that town for the next several hundred years or so. So Iceland is expensive in comparison to a lot of destinations. And if you have any questions or inquiries, my email is uh, on the screen and don't hesitate to uh, reach out if there's anything that uh, you need to know. Um, we can um, tell you about or even arrange optional uh, activities for travelers. Uh, there's a um, lot of things to do within the city. And you can also, if you, if you plan to extend your stay or uh, show up early, um, there are some great day tours in whale watching. You can go the Golden Circle. You can drive in the southern part of Iceland. You can visit the secret lagoons, etc. So don't hesitate to reach out if there is anything that you want to, you know, arrange for. Uh, but since our time is up, I will just say Takk fyrir, which is thank you in Icelandic. Yes, thank you and thank you again. And just just for information, so this re recorded webinar will be published at the website and also the the slides. And if you have now, we don't have time for further questions, but you can reach each presenter via email and so on, depending on their presentation about me on the process, Helga for uh, tourism and uh, so on. Uh, uh, but uh, so um, we hope you had a good uh, webinar and that you know a little more about it. So you'll be able to r uh, register and you can also show this um, video when it's up uh, to your colleagues that is relevant for. So thank you and we see you within the work.